So today we're talking about the difference in neocaridineus or cherry shrimp and cardineus or maybe you know some as crystal reds. If you're interested in the various differences and how to breed one versus the other and what conditions you have to have for cardinias that's different from neocaridineus, stay tuned and check it out. Hello YouTube, Patrick with Homebred Aquatics. So as I said, today we're gonna to be talking about the difference in these popular shrimp to breed. Now I've bred both of these types of shrimp quite successfully in the past, but I'm going to go into how you breed them and what makes them different. So if you haven't watched my myths and facts on Neocaridineus, please go watch that because I don't want to dive too deep into the weeds on various things about breeding Neocaridineus. However, I do want to illustrate some of the huge differences between the two. So let's first point out conditions. Now, these shrimp can be in the same conditions, but one of them can't. So cardinias or crystal reds are, I would call, a near expert level shrimp. They require very special care and they tend to die if they're not taken care of that way. Where neos or cherries, they don't really care. So now I wanna dive into what makes cardinias or crystal reds so different. So what makes them different is the fact that they require very specific parameters. Now this might be the first time you've ever heard of it, but TDS, total dissolved solids. Total dissolved solids tracks the amount of minerals um, or dissolved solids in the water. Now with cherry shrimp, it really doesn't matter. I think I've had it as high as 800, which is blistering high, don't do that. Um, but with cardinias, they tend to start to die at like three, 400 parts per million. Now, why is that exactly? Normally, that's because there's something tainting the water. Cardinias like very low TDS. Now, I generally would keep my TDS in between 150 to 250, no higher. Very religious about it. Now, you might ask, Patrick, how do you do that? Well, first off, you have to use RODI water. Um, reverse osmosis deionized water um, and if you're not near a store that sells it the options are there you can buy a RO unit off of Amazon I'll give you a link in the description or off of a site called bulk reef supply it's very popular for us in the saltwater community to use RODI um, but not so much in the freshwater community unless you just have terrible tap water. And if you do, maybe you'll benefit from that. So outside of TDS, the other really big difference is going to be cardinias or crystal reds really want a low, low, low pH. Now, I found it's kind of hard to do a really low pH, um, but there's definitely things that help out. Number one in that is substrate. Ensure you have a good quality substrate that will lower your pH. Unfortunately, a lot of those very um, buffering pHs give off a lot of ammonia, and therefore your cycling process in your tank is very strenuous. So like Amazonia V2 or Landon or a lot of your aqua soils or even shrimp soils give off a lot of ammonia. So cycling and paying attention to your parameters within the first few months is pertinent. Honestly, I wouldn't even grab cardinias until it's been like three or four months down the road that you know that tank is matured and ready to go. Now outside of buffering substrates, we in more experienced breeders tend to use this thing called a Gravel filter. So this is an acrylic box. Sorry, it's a little dirty. It was in one of my tanks. I had taken it out. 
And in here I have substrate. Um, I think I had Landon in here and I would replace the substrate in these boxes roughly every two to three months to ensure that it was it was like almost not tumbling but it was filtering through the gravel and pulling as much of that buffering solution out of the substrate as it can. You'll have a bubble stone, bubble rock, whatever you want to call it, that goes down in here and then that will force air from the bottom uh, up through the gravel, pulling through the gravel and then back out the top. And this isn't so much of a filter as it is just a way to really lower the pH. Outside of that, you can use botanicals like catapa leaves um, and various uh, lotus bulbs and things like that. There's a lot of options there. Just look up botanicals. You just have to be a little bit of careful with botanicals raising your TDS from various things that might be attached to them. So maybe flash boiling, baking, washing very well. Those are very important. pH is really one of the biggest deciding factors when it comes to these guys. I mean like really important. Patrick here. I completely forgot to mention the pH for these guys and ideally you're trying to get between 5.5 and 6.5 pH with the substrates and the various different botanicals to breed these guys. Temperature is your other huge difference when it comes to Neos. Neos don't care. They'll take mid 50s to high 80s. They could care less. You let a Cardinia get over 75, it's done. It's 72 is pushing it. Um, so a lot of the time it either has to be in a cold spot in your room, uh, away from the windows, away from it, uh, air vents that might heat up the water, uh, stuff like that. Anything that would heat it up uh, or if you have a really cold house, that might work out but your biggest alternative is a chiller. Now I've seen them get up to 75, so don't worry, but the stress gets up there. It starts creeping up as the temperature rises. So be very careful with that. These guys are really sensitive to many, many things. So kind of a number three to this is going to be KH and GH. Carbon hardness or alkalinity and GH, general hardness. Now, when it comes to Neos, I mean, super high, they start to have issues, but in the moderate levels and anything below that, I haven't seen Neos have problems at all. However, Cardinias or Crystal Reds are again a different story. When it comes to alkalinity, they really don't tolerate it. Uh, you have to have between a zero and a one on a scale of alkalinity or KH, carbon hardness, anything outside of that and things get a little wishy-washy. I can't tell you the exact point that it just kills them all because I've never wanted to try that and heard these really expensive shrimp nor my bank account. Anyway, but my point here being, again, a very particular thing. I'm sure the tank behind me, the carbon hardness is probably eight, maybe even 10 for the shrimp. Crystals would never do that. They would never tolerate that. Maybe the toughest of strands, but not the normals. Now, when it comes to GH, general hardness, the hardness of the water, um, soft and then hard scale, they like being in the middle. Uh, generally, we the four uh, to eight um, is where you want to be. Now, there's kind of a helpful tip to doing that and calculating it outside of using APIs like drop tester and that test just sucks. Uh, Salifert makes a freshwater test that's really nice as well. Um, but you can actually use the TDS meter I mentioned before. And since you're only using RODI or you should only be using RODI, the RODI water should be coming out at zero TDS. And the only thing you should be adding to your RO water is going to be general hardness up or plus or anything to add a little bit of hardness to that water. So for me, I use more conditioner. 
Uh, it's a bee shrimp mineralized uh, mineral conditioner. Uh, one of the best breeders here in America really recommended this. Talked to him for a long time, bought it. Fantastic, really easy to use, really easy to measure out. I can literally drip it in a few times, wait a little while, check my TDS again, and then go from there and see how much I need to do per water change. And then there's the bee shrimp GH plus uh, by our German friends. And that is also a great option as well. Uh, either or will throw that GH up a bit, but I recommend trying to get on the higher end side of your GH supplements. Really don't cheap it out. These are expensive shrimp. But understand that's another huge difference between them. They just don't tolerate higher parameters like that. All right. I think last on my list for differences, and this one actually took me a really long time to know, is food. So neocard neocaridinia, I always mess it up, um, or cherry shrimp prefer a more protein-rich diet. Um, so for instance, I've mentioned this before, but I love feeding mine Shrimp King Complete. Now if we look back here, do I have a nutrition label? I have things in German, anyway. Um, I know it has a higher protein content. Its ingredients are more protein based and that's what you're looking for your Neos. I mean, they'll eat anything, but a higher protein diet for their foods should be your go-to. It's the exact opposite for Cardinias or Crystals. Cardinias, Crystals, bee shrimp, whatever you want to call them, they prefer a much more vegetarian diet. So for instance, I have mulberry pollen munch here and I don't have any more other random foods, but I have a ton in my closet that I keep that are all very rich in veggies um, because they just prefer a much lower protein diet. Not only prefer, but thrive in a lower protein diet. That means grazing on algae and various things like that are much more up their alley. And you'll see a lot of breeders talk about focusing on algae walls and stuff like that, which I'll get into in another video. Um, but you just want to focus on that vegetarian. You can do zucchini and various vegetables too, blanched and thrown in. Just know there is a significant difference in diet. And again, uh, everything I say doesn't mean that they will just die. Uh, but if you're having issues, it's likely because you're not following one of these things or a few of them combined. And I've been guilty of it myself. Now, to kind of conclude some things. We know generally neocaridinias, cherry shrimp take all sorts of parameters. And now we know that cardinias, crystal reds, <laughs> Do not. They prefer very specific parameters in a small ballpark. Now you can put them both in the same tank. Let's say I have Blue Dreams, one of my most popular sellers, and Crystal Reds in the same tank. Now I've learned something and, and I've also proved it wrong, but for the most part, if I am breeding Cardinias really well, I'm not breeding Neos really well because Cardinias like to breed in 5, 5.5 pH. Um, they'll, they'll breed all the way up to six, but I've seen when it gets in that higher echelon of six, it's a no-go. However, once it gets into sixes, then you get Neos will breed. But Neos will also tolerate sub six as well. So you either have a booming population of one or the other. Generally not both. I was told that a lot and for the most part, for the most part, I've seen that. I have bread, reds, um, cherries, really nice cherries, and crystals in the same tank. And the purpose of that is that they cannot inbreed or they cannot breed with each other. They are completely different, I guess, genuses or families. Um, I need to up my knowledge on how that separates. But completely different sexual reproduction types so they can't interbreed. Now, some other interesting facts about Cardinias is 
unlike cherry shrimp, where if you mix a blue and a red, you get a brown, or an odd color sometimes. It's never consistent. When you mix Cardinia species together, you get some really odd ball stuff. A lot of the times it's coals and these mixes of really rainbowy, weird shrimp. But sometimes you get these really interesting species. And this is what we're seeing with a lot of breeders that are just focused on Cardinias lately. Uh, bee shrimp crystals, those kinds of things. Is they're interbreeding these high um, quality shrimp together. And they're calling out for the good these very, very pretty shrimp which then go into a new generation of breeding together to create uh, this new line of shrimp that ends up being like $350, $400 for a single shrimp. It's ridiculous. Um, but there is a small market out there for that. So that is a cool thing about Cardinians. You don't have to worry about, hey, I want some crystal reds, some blue bolts, some Taiwan Taiwanese uh, bees, some galaxy fish bones. I want all of them in my in my 20 gallon tank. You don't really have to worry about it um, because when they inbreed, you kind of get some cool looking stuff. There's no like brown, ugly. I mean, you might get onesie twosies, but you're gonna get some pretty interesting stuff out of it. I really hope you guys learned quite a bit about the difference in Cardinius and Neocaridinius. Um, and kind of understand what goes into caring for and breeding these guys. Because if you can honestly care for them, you can breed them. And what the major difference is with Neos. If you plan on embarking on that journey, just do a little bit more research, even outside of me, and understand these guys can be a lot. I'm a testament to losing thousands of dollars on Cardinia shrimp because I just thought I could do it all well before I knew a lot. But anyway, I really appreciate you guys tuning in. Please leave a like below and check out my video on myths and facts with Neocardinia shrimp. Thank you. Bye.